The following interview was conducted with Marie McKee uh, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, February the 23rd, 2009, in Stewart Center, 263. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. And tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. Okay. Um, well, I was born in Greencastle, Indiana. Um, and my parents uh, have lived most of their uh, lives in Indiana. Um, I grew up and went to school in Greencastle High School, and then I went to Purdue. Um, my father um, grew up in a time period where there wasn't enough money to go to school, and he always wanted me to go to Purdue. <laughs> and so I ended up going to Purdue. Ted, can you tell us a little bit about high school and were any activities that uh, you were in, high, uh, um, student yes. organizations? Okay. Sure. Um, I was very active in 4-H, and that was a big part of my life um, the whole time growing up. I was also um, uh, in the thespian group there and was um, best thespian my senior year in high school. Um, and I was very active in dance and summer theater. I actually did choreography for a lot of high school and then um, local summer theater at DePaul University there in Greencastle. Very good. Do you have any brothers or sisters, any siblings? I have one brother who's nine years younger than I am, who uh -huh. lives in Ohio now and graduated from Purdue as well and runs his own business. Okay. Now let's move to Purdue then. Um, tell us a little bit about your experiences there, including organizations, where you lived and what your major and professors, et cetera. Um, I, uh, what year did you enter Purdue? 1969. Okay. And I graduated with a bachelor's degree in 1973. Mm -hmm. um, then I went to work there, and I also did a master's part-time, um, graduated with a master's degree in 1975. Okay. What was campus? Were you in a sorority here? And, and any activities? Tell us a little about it. And also, what was campus like when you were here as a um, student? It was 16,000 kids, so mm -hmm. it was a lot smaller uh -huh. than it is right now. Sure. Um, and uh, I, uh, my family was pretty poor, so I actually um, worked very hard while I was at school, putting myself through school. And the last two years of school, I supported myself entirely um, for uh, being able to go to school. And one of the people who was very helpful uh, in that was a man named Mr. Pearson, who ran the um, Fowler Courts at the time they were called, the mm -hmm. sort of Quonset Hut um, places. And he allowed me to be a resident assistant my junior and uh, senior year, which at that point paid tuition, room, and board. And that and work study and loans was enough to get me through school. Very good. Um, what was your major? And uh, any student? What were your any student clubs that you belonged to? Um, I helped in the um, National 4-H uh, office there, um, and I worked there and, and, and worked with that. Um, there wasn't a whole bunch of time for activities and right. clubs other than the normal sure. kinds of things because of working. But um, I did uh, live on campus. I did not join a sorority. I lived on campus the entire time. And um, I ended up, you know, doing the sort of normal student things, um, you know, grades and so sure. forth took a lot of time, but then football games and oh yeah. Um, what were you know, doing? What were you that the Fowler courts and all that were were mostly, and then some of the student union, student association sure. things. Can you tell for the researchers what were some of the duties as the, in the uh, at Fowler courts? What were some of the responsibilities, the job that you had there? Um, you actually had a lot of responsibility. Um, it was surprising how many things I learned. Uh, in that job as a student still um, that I use to this day. Um, Good. So I, uh, I was responsible for the 50 kids who lived in these little um, areas. There were three buildings and there were about 15 to 17 kids in each of the areas. Um, and you were responsible for their well-being and their health and disposing of alcohol and um, making sure that they were okay. And um, so there, uh, that was at the time there was a decision that that would be the last residence hall that would fill. And uh, so there were kids who were really struggling with the transition between um, high school and college, and 
there were a lot of um, disciplinary things to take care of the first semester, especially with freshman students. So I learned a lot about campus police and alcohol and I bet how to you deal did. with kids who were in transition and how to try to get them to resources at the university so that they could um, get on track to be what they wanted to be. And um, wow. so it was, uh, it was actually a huge learning experience. Right. Did you have um, responsible for all three of them in the three little houses there that uh, they yes. lived in? Okay. Yes. What about meals? Did they have the meals there? The meals were across the way in the main building where okay. the hall um, manager was and also uh, where there was a serving area for food and so forth. Okay, okay, right. I majored in the um, home economics program, which was at the time I called home economics, later turned to consumer and family sciences. I chose that because I'm 58 years old. When I went to school from Indiana, you were either going to be a teacher or a nurse. I wasn't going to be a nurse, so that by default, I was going to be a teacher. Um, and I that never taught. I uh, finished a degree, and then I said, okay, what am I going to do now? Sure. And um, fortunately, um, Purdue uh, at that time selected one senior in the consumer and family sciences program to be part of the admissions team to go out to high schools to try to recruit kids to come to Purdue. And I was selected for that position and I did it for a year and they thought I did a good job so they asked me to stay a second year. And I worked with the admissions office um, as well. And then by that time I had finished a master's in counseling and family economics and decided it was time to look for a little bit different assignment at Purdue and ended up taking the assignment that Jane referred to, the Women and um, Minorities Program at the Engineering School. Good. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, what, uh, and who was the head of the department? Tell, tell us a little bit about that for the researchers, what's um, your duties and challenges, et cetera. Right. So uh, the duties were to really try to um, spread the word, if you will, that if you were good in math and science, that engineering was um, a lot more than being an engineer on a train, which was sort of the, you know, the joke at the time. Uh, things have improved considerably in the last, you know, 30, 40 years. But at that time, it was a very small um, number of people who would really, women who would really consider coming into the program. And so um, they had a director of minority engineering programs, which was Miriam Blaylock, and a director of women in engineering programs, which had been Christy Smith, and she was leaving, um, and they selected me. And they had a hard time figuring out if I was the best candidate for the job because I, you know, I had majored in such a traditional field, but I think they thought I had good, strong sales skills and would be able to talk to students well, and so that's how I got the job, and Dr. Amrine, Harold Amrine, was the uh, head of the department at that point, and he was very um, progressive in trying to get uh, women to study engineering and uh, minorities to study engineering, and so over the years, we ran a lot of programs in the summer, visited a lot of high schools, took kids with us, tried to figure out... Um, you know, support systems for them to feel like they wanted to remain in the school. They never had trouble with the studies. The studies were usually the um, probably the easiest part. The thing that was hard was seeing yourself, no role model, seeing yourself as a woman engineer and um, and seeing yourself in a job that had a lot of men in the in that job and how were you going to manage, you know, if you wanted to have family and career and all that. And so a lot of time spent on having them talk to other women, having women visit the campus and uh, who were engineers, and um, making sure the Society of Women Engineers chapter there was extremely active and began to be a place where uh, women could find role models for other people who, you know, wanted the same things that they did. Sure. Was the, uh, the, the program then, before you took it over, had been in existence? It had been in existence, yes. Christine Smith, um, Dr. Christy Smith was the, uh, and Donna, um, Donna, 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 Donna Froelich. Um, the two of them had been in charge of the program, and it had been both women and minorities. And then I believe Dr. Amron uh, split the program and dedicated 
one person to the women program and one person to the minority program, and that was when Marion Blaylock was hired to uh, do the minorities, and I was hired to do the women. Okay. Were there, uh, but there weren't very many women in the engineering programs at that time? No, they? and I would really have to go back and oh. try to ferret that grew. out. But yeah. Oh, it grew tremendously. Sure. Right. It grew tremendously. Um, and th at that time, there was probably, I don't know, 2,000, 3,000 kids in engineering, and maybe 5% of them were uh, women. And by the time that I left there, six years later, it was like 15% oh, um, were true. women. It was huge. And we in Georgia Tech were... Um, the two programs that were the largest um, programs in the country for women to study engineering. That's what I, one thing I was going to ask you, whether uh, you saw on the topics, whether similar programs in Georgia Tech was about the only other one other than Peru that had one? Yes, mm -hmm. of that, of that yeah, caliber, sure. right. Other people were starting, but um, Georgia Tech and Purdue had the, the biggest uh, programs and the most really happening and the most women graduating at the sure. end of a four or five year period. Right. Um, did you have some uh, workshops, and then did you also do some traveling uh, to other schools like you had done when you were in the admissions office? Were those some of the th things that you did? Yes, okay. and uh, that's exactly what I did. We ran a lot of summer programs, uh, several uh, weeks of summer programs, and we solicited um, funding from uh, corporations to underwrite the um, program costs. and. So we get grants for those, and then we would use the grants to have kids come in and, and spend a week basically learning about engineering, organized the programs, did the uh, brochures, talked to people to, you know, organize to get the kids here and so forth. Sure. And you were located in ENAD, in the Engineering Administration yes. Building? Yes, yes. Okay, right. Second floor or something like that. Yeah. Was um, Dick McDowell also uh, in that department at that yes. time, too? Yes, he was the assistant um uh, head of uh, freshman engineering, and I think later became the head of freshman engineering. Um, Blaine Butler was a professor there. Um, uh -huh. Mr. Smith, Dr. Smith. Uh, Clyde Smith? Uh, Clyde Smith, that was it. I was trying to say Cliff Smith. I knew that wasn't right. Clyde Smith, um, they were both really active with the, um, with the students, and we all had responsibilities for seeing students and being sure that they could get you know their coursework assigned and get done what they needed to get done and if if and we saw both men and women it wasn't just women in the freshman engineering department you could see any of the advisors and so i registered a lot of kids for classes sure and then of course then they had day on campus as well right and, that's right yeah we had um, people visiting all the time and talking about what it was like to select engineering sure very good okay uh what was the uh, uh chauncey village you remember what that was like when you were here is it uh, chauncey village it's probably grown over time though um, uh yeah i don't really have much to say about sure. that um where did you live when you were on campus what was the uh, housing uh, situation at that time I lived in Fowler for the first two years, and mm -hmm. then I lived um, in a single at Fowler as the as the resident assistant for the last two years. So I ended up staying all four years there. Okay, uh, even why? And then when you were in women engineering, you lived lived near campus, and uh, I did. I yeah. lived um, about you had you had to drive, but I think it was thirty six. You went out just a little ways outside of town, like two miles. And sure. Lived there. Yeah, very good. Okay. Uh, that, um, after Then when you left Purdue, you say, what year did you leave Purdue? 79. Okay. And uh, what, what took place after that? Can you share that with us? Sure. Uh, okay. I came to work for Corning Incorporated, and okay. I have now worked here 30 years. So Congratulations. I, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, when I left Purdue, I was essentially recruiting students to come to Purdue, and when I came to work at Corning, I was recruiting um, those students who had graduated to come to work for Corning, so oh. just sort of moved from one side of the table to the other side of the table. <laughs> oh, another, ru another bump in the road, right? <laughs> right, right. Uh, uh, skill sets were the same, travel, you know, go sure. to college campuses and talk to kids and um, see if they would have an interest in Corning. I had decided as I completed a master's that if I was going to stay at Purdue, you really needed to do a Ph.D. because it's a, you know, it's a first-rate school, and the people who are there over the long term for the most part are 
PhDs, and I really didn't have any interest in doing that. That's not me. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I started looking for jobs um, in industry and was fortunate enough to land the job at Corning. Very good. That's not. Have you been back to campus at all in, during this interim? Do you come back have, at all? Uh, I have been back a few times. In the early years, I was back quite a bit, and I was the Purdue-designated recruiter for Corning. Okay. Um, so I did that for a few years. In the last 15 years, I have not been back very much at all. I've been back a little bit. My family still lives in Greencastle, so I'm occasionally there. Sure. Um, I may have seen you at one time because I, over time I have gone to the, uh, the, the job fair that they have and, of course, the awards thing, which was this past weekend. Ah, and yeah. uh, so I may have seen you because I used to go, I've gone there with a friend of mine, and I, w I always enjoyed it. And I was pleased one year about four years ago, a student who worked for me in chemical, major in chemical engineering, she got one of the awards, and I was just really glad for her. Oh, that's <laughs> so great. It's a nice program, you know, and, yeah. they, and big things too. Um, any, uh, any awards or honors that, uh, that you'd like to share with us that you've uh, received over time? Anything um, particular or uh, association uh, offices, any of the professional associations? Um, well, I've become a senior vice president at Corning. I guess that's an award of That course. certainly is. That's very good. Um, and um, here I have done a lot of work with women and minorities as well. So I was selected by the Select Society of Black Professionals here um, for their top award. I've been, I was selected by uh, Purdue as a distinguished al alumni, as, as you just mentioned. Um, there have been a number of arts awards over the years because I have been very interested in the arts and um, uh -huh. have supported the arts, so I have done a lot of work in that area. I'm on the board of um, uh, a $10 billion utility company called uh, Progress Energy. Um, so I have... Um, Quite a mirror of, of, of awards that you've gotten, which is very nice. And uh, then other response and association responsibilities as well on the boards and things like that. Yeah, thank uh, you. Very nice, yes. Any yeah. particular hobbies that uh, you mentioned, the arts, that, that uh, occupy, and that's a nice hobby to have, interest yeah, to have. Yeah, that's it's definitely uh, part of the uh, area of interest that I have, and I've worked with the local arts organizations, and in Corning I had the privilege to run our art crystal business um, called Stuben Glass, and I have um, been in charge of the Corning Museum of Glass, which is actually not about Corning at all. It's about the material of glass, and mm. we have um, about 50,000 objects of art glass that um, span 3,000 years of glass making from the earliest pieces of glass made by the Romans to today, so that's been a a uh, real passion over the years. I also sail. I learned to uh, sail because um, I wanted to learn to sail, but my um, what is now husband of 28 years was uh, the person who taught me to sail after I came here. And um, then I also learned to ski after I came here because there weren't very many hills down there <laughs> in uh, Lafayette or in Corning. So. Um, I still like to bike ride, which I learned a lot about in Indiana. That was my pastime, so I still do a fair amount of biking. So we do a lot of outdoor things, and um, we have raised two kids. One is. I was going to ask you about family. Did you meet your husband at Corning? I did. Uh -huh. I did. He does not work for Corning, thankfully. There's a little diversification there <laughs> in the family. And um, we have two daughters. Uh, one is currently a third-year medical student, so she's about... 15 months away from being a doctor and um, where does she go to medical school Thomas Jefferson in Philadelphia okay uh-huh and our youngest daughter is a freshman at George Washington University in DC oh very good well that keeps you busy going back and forth yeah, them. yeah. that's very nice yeah. um, I'm gonna ask you can you recall any uh, Purdue tradition that you recall uh, when the time that you were here that was uh, special uh, for you um, well, there were always wonderful football games and Boilermaker Pete and the uh, train that went through the middle of campus and the um, uh, rolls of toilet paper that went <laughs> from the fans when, when the uh, um, football team scored um, for Purdue. So those were the kinds of things I guess I remember a lot. That was fun. Yes. And, of course, the stadium has been enlarged since you were here, you know. Yes, that, I've it, seen that. It's quite large. It really uh, is, even in the period of time that I have been here quite a while, too. How about an outstanding event? Any uh, Something that comes to mind on that? 
that you'd like to share with us? Um, an outstanding event in my life, probably the birth of both children. Those were outstanding events. Very good. Excellent. Um, I think that's probably the most significant. I think certainly um, having the opportunity at Corning to move from um, running human resources for Corning to running a business was a very big change and a very welcome one. Um, so it was something that I... Um, and very happy I worked for an employer that was willing to do that, and it, it was a great experience. Good. And uh, any, uh, it, I'm going to leave the, the file ending for you. Any closing or uh, additional things that you'd like to uh, share with us? Um, well, I just thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak to you. I hope that um, the material that you're gathering is useful to kids as they look back. I think women have so many more opportunities now than they had in the past, and I need, think they need to continue to um, expand those horizons because the world really has a lot of interesting assignments that are, whether they're part-time or full-time or full-time and a half, uh, you know, it, sure. you can pick your place along the continuum, but there are a lot of interesting things to do, and women um, add value to organizations when they're part of it, so I'm very encouraging of them to do so. Very good. I thank you very much, Marie McKee. It's been very nice, and I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to chat with you, and, and we'll be sending you a copy of the transcript for you to go over. Okay. Go. Thanks, thanks again. Much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>